I have given you the handout. It's not really 100% germane of what I'm talking about at this moment, but it's, I thought you'd like to see some of the facts and figures about this wonderful archaeological site we call the Bowser Road site, uh, which is in Orange County, New York. And uh, you can take that home with you, and um, when the monograph comes out, maybe you'll find out that I have changed the figures slightly, but the radiocarbon dates won't be changed. Uh, the site is uh, definitely 13,026, uh, plus or minus 35 or there about calendar years before present. What I want to speak about um, here, and we're uh, in, in the first portion of this little delivery, um, is about the possibility, essentially, of our finding of mastodons uh, here in the uh, valley. Uh, really, it's quite remarkable that despite all the farming and work that's happened here, uh, we really don't have any mastodons. I mean, I'm not aware of any. Uh, do any of you know of any uh, bona fide reports of, uh, of uh, mastodon remains uh, in the Connecticut River Valley? It's remarkable. Because just over the mountain, in Orange County, New York, you have the classic area for mastodons in all of North America. In Orange County, New York, there are 66 proboscidians that have been reported from one county. Uh, and, and the reporting began as early as General George Washington's period. He, he visited a, uh, one of these discoveries when he was uh, engaged in the Red War. Um, and the, the Bowser Road site is located in Orange County, and it is the 66th set of remains. It happens to be the only set of remains with a human, bona fide human association. But there are many. So here we have none, and over there, there are a multitude. And that's not even to count the ones in, near Albany, New York, and Sauger tees and on both sides of the river. I mean, it's a veritable Provisidian paradise <coughs> to the west of the uh, Berkshires. Why not here? Because this valley was open for settlement. <coughs> we know because of uh, Jason's Clovis Point and other things, I mean, and, and the geology uh, for some period of time. So, that's something we should be thinking about very, very, and, and looking. Now, uh, I, by the way, I'm going to pass this booklet around uh, only because uh, it's, it's intended for a youth audience, although it, it's very well, well done, has these paintings in it, and so forth, but it's, um, it's called the Mastodon Mystery. Well, that sounds kind of hokey. But it really isn't, because when this mastodon was found around the year 1800, most people believed no animals had ever gone extinct. And this obviously disappeared animal, missing animal from the no human society had known such a thing. Uh, that was proof positive that animals had gone extinct. And it did much to bolster uh, and prepare people for the theory of evolution. So it, it was a mystery to the people in 1800. No longer a mystery, but back then it was. And it caused consternation uh, when this mastodon was put on exhibit by the Peels in Philadelphia. Uh, it, uh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people paid for admittance. And by 1843, the, the, the effect had worn off, and the um, Philadelphians sold it to the Germans. And as I understand it, it's in Dortmund right now. You can go see it, uh, but no longer in the United States. In any case, um, the, the dates uh, for mastodons uh, and, and 
I'm speaking specifically about mastodons, not mammoths, in North America, uh, suggest that the, they disappeared uh, roughly 10,400 to 10,200 radiocarbon years ago um, during the period of the, uh, the Sugarloaf uh, occupancy, I would think. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, ultimately people are responsible. Um, now, uh, so there's no good reason why they wouldn't be here. And studies of mastodons show that they do move. We don't have a lot of evidence, but that which we do comes from Florida. And strontium analysis of the growth ring increments on the tusks the, uh, this is a strontium uh, isotope analysis, as reported in this volume uh, out of Germany. Uh, this, uh, the, those strontium tests indicate that the, the mastodons of Florida likely were leaving their seaside locations uh, and going up into the foothills of the Appalachians and then coming back and doing it all over again. So those animals moved perhaps regularly, perhaps yearly, uh, back and forth, and, were, and, and their strontium and their bones uh, changed uh, in uh, isotope amount because they're uh, different, uh, uh, different strontiums in different landscapes, different water that they drank. So these animals were peripatetic, you might say, or they migrated. The mammoth, though, Studies that have been done in the Florida with the Florida evidence indicate that they didn't move. They were homeboys. They stayed around. Uh, they did not go through this long. So they're quite different in their habits. Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting anyways. So the evidence that we have about, and it's so scanty. Remember what I told you initially. It isn't so much what we know, it's what we don't know. So based, that we're talking about today, so based on the Florida evidence, we here in New England, uh, we'll jump a thousand miles or more to the north, we in New England would hold out the possibility that perhaps the mastodons of the Hudson River Valley in Orange County periodically went into the mountains or the highlands, maybe for the summer, where there were succulent vegetations around these ephemeral ponds and things. And maybe they went into the Berkshires and then they returned to the Hudson Valley. But if they did it for the Hudson Valley back and forth to the Berkshires, would they have not done it from the Connecticut Valley into the Berkshires? I ask you, of course, we, there have to be mastodons here in the Connecticut River Valley. And if there are, Sooner or later, we'll find one with human involvement. Now, the person who will be coming up on the stage in a few minutes is Professor Emeritus Dr. Malcolm LeCompte, uh, who's going to be working uh, with a property owner on, and, and doing some reconnoitering uh, at a mastodon site in the Berk in Berkshire County. And for aught we know, that mastodon came from the Connecticut River Valley. We don't know. Might have come from the Hudson Valley. But one thing I can say is that the Clovis people who were hunting and butchering these proboscideans, these mastodons, upon occasion, they were killing them in different places. That's about all I can say, in different places. And what I mean by that is, at the Bowser Road Mastodon site in Orange County, New York, we read the strontium values for the tissues of that animal, the ivory and the bone. And then we calculated the strontium values for the artifacts the ivory and the bone that showed where that had been deposited with that mastodon, and they have a different strontium geochemical signature completely. 
In other words, they're not made of that animal that was killed, that mastodon. They're made from another mastodon from somewhere else. Where that elsewhere was, I don't know. Maybe it was the Connecticut Valley, or maybe it was the crest of the Berkshires, or maybe it was in the Catskills. I can't tell you, but it's, a, it's enough to know, perhaps, at this time, that Clovis is ranging around with dogs, perhaps. Think about that. They're mobile. And they take an animal somewhere else and then discard its worn out artifacts with their newly killed animal. This is not something, the very fact that you can find a mastodon kill and butchery site and find these artifacts that are from somewhere else until this site was found was unknown. I, I can't tell you how fresh that insight, small as it is, is. It's, it's brand new. The very fact that these artifacts, we can, we can go to kill sites and find such things is wonderful news. Because folks, if we find more kill sites, we're going to find more artifacts. And one day, there's going to be a piece of Ice Age art found with some of those artifacts. It's only now a matter of time. Now we know where to look. The Bowser Road site, which I'm doing a monograph about, and by the way, don't think I'm being too mercantile, but I need your names if you want to be sent a flyer. Because I'm only going to print about 600 copies of this book. It's going to, it's going to cost a lot of money, and I don't. But if you want to be sent one of the flyers, <coughs> just sign in that list. I'll just, um, you know, there, uh, I have names of 80 or 100 other people there. I just, it's the only way I know to get the word out. In any case, at Bowser Road, we're, we found all these ivory and bone artifacts, fantastic things. I have one of them out on the table, the ivory ads for you to see. I'll open the case, you can look at it. It's as we found it in the ground. The polish on it, it, it is clearly clear that it was well worn and used. So, but what we did, I wasn't prepared for it. I was just about done, took all the bones down to the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard where they're going to be stored in perpetuity. And I look, had the last thing to look through was the ribs. And lo and behold, as I looked through the ribs, I realized that many of the ribs had been split, flattened, polished, and cut. In fact, many had been broken regularly as if they were snapped over an anvil. And the amount of force that is required to do it is fantastic. Um, I'm going to go get one thing I have to show you to pass around. The, uh, do, do you have that? Is that ivory uh, uh, yes. club? Is it near the door there? Yeah. Good. And, and uh, bring the ax, too, if you don't mind. This is a Clovis replica axe. But this you must see. You're New Englanders. And, and this is most of you. And this is, this is your own culture you're looking at here. No, the, uh, the, the ivory piece. Okay. You want that? Yes, I want this. Okay. I didn't know if you had people that were pestering. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This axe is an exact replica based on the Richie Clovis cash axe that I dug up. This is made of hop hornbeam, which is a species that grew at the Bowser Road site at, during the Clovis occupancy. This axe chops bone as well as a steel axe chops birch. You can chop an entire skeleton up with this. And the marks of the, a celt or an axe of this size were left on the Bowser Road skeleton. We have, as you saw in the list that's been passed around, we have 60-some bones that have been chopped up as if they were cordwood. The chips went flying. We put the chips back on the bones. But truly, this mastodon was not only butchered, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was torn to pieces. You know, but uh, it's it's the it's the bone rod. Oh, bone rod. Okay. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to. I'm going to pass around this amazing artifact. I want you to feel it. This is a New England artifact. This is what's used to kill the white pup seals. And, and a good many were killed with this, I don't doubt, because of the polish from handling. I got this in an estate. Oh, thank you. I got this in an estate in Newburyport. And this was probably taken up to the Strait of Belle Isle and did in God knows how many thousands of seals. So this is part of your New England heritage, okay? for better or for worse. But that's not why I'm passing it around. I want you to feel the weight and the strength of a piece of sperm whale rib. A sperm whale dives to 3,000 feet to eat squid. And his ribs must be so strong to resist the pressure of 3,000 feet in the sea. Now, this hard bone the mastodon ribs of John Charles, our mastodon from the Bowser Road roadside, would have been of this hardness, I would have thought. So pass that quickly around, but look at that 18th century, 19th century artifact. So the Bowser Road mastodon, our mastodon, a bull who died at 55 to 65 years of age, that bull surely fought other mastodons, and we know they succeeded in killing one another. An animal that weighs 8 to 10 tons, and the force behind the tips of those tusks, the ribs must be very strong. So, wasn't it a surprise to me to find these ribs that were split end for end and made into artifacts? It must have been a very clever Clovis person who had the knowledge to make such artifacts. And these are addle addles for throwing darts. They're 24 inches long, all of the length. Um, they have V notches at the end for the most part. Um, these are the first addle addles that have ever been recognized in an archaeological site. And we have, I believe, 16 of them at the Bowser Road site. They're all broken into these short pieces over an anvil stone. And they were left lying there. Now, I have to move right along because of Dr. Lacan, but let me say this. That's a ritual that's taking place. And I believe, I will maintain, that that mastodon was killed because people were going through, it was a test of strength and metal, and probably people were advancing through age sets in their society, and this was the event that marked the graduation into the age set or its leaving, either one. But this type of periodic killing or event to uh, coincide with age set in, uh, in human beings as they change in their societal position. It's very common in the world. The pastoral Maasai, if you're a Maasai boy, um, and when you're 10 or 11, an age set is open, a flower blooms, a flower blooms only once in seven years, you know it's time to open the age set, you get circumcised, and you become a warrior. Then six, seven, eight years later, the flower blooms again, and the next group of men are circumcised and become warriors. And those two groups of young men who are now warriors are in the same age set, which is about the length of a human generation. Seven to 10 years is a very important time to human beings in many societies the world over. I would argue that the Bowser Road Mastodon was selected to be killed to mark those intervals, one of those intervals of time. Now, Vladimir Fatuko, working independently in Eurasia, 
with the four sites that are well dated and explored, likewise has found that mammoths are being killed at these long intervals. Not every year, not every two years, no, every seven or eight years they're being killed. They're not being killed to live upon, although the meat and the products surely were used, but rather they're being killed for social reasons. And the products, of course, are used after the death. The animal is a dangerous quarry. Uh, it's um, a dangerous event. Uh, a few people will likely would die if it were only done by a few. But if an entire band pooled its resources and all the hunters participated, then the death of the animal was a foregone. And we have at the Bowser Road site 16 athletics. One per hunter? Who knows? All I can say is this. To test this hypothesis that there might be atlatls, I went to the Buffalo Museum of Science where I used to work years ago. And there they have a collection of mastodons from the Hiscock site. There are 20 some mastodons. They reckon that the mastodons that came to grief there might be as many as 80 to 100 over a period of 700 years. Do your math, and that means one every seven to 10 years. And when I look through the bones, because no archeologist has really gone through the bones, I found, and I'm not surprised, pieces of here are the four unrecognized of V-notches being very distinctive in their end. So all I'm going to say is Bowser Road, which is truly a butchered mastodon, one that human beings have definitely had something to do with it, ritual activity took place there. Up to this point in time, most of the mastodons, in my opinion, that we have investigated we really missed the boat on interpretation, or these were not really heavily butchered. So this is what this site has to tell us. Now, shifting gears slightly, I told you the date of the site is roughly 13,000 calendar years. At around 12,900 calendar years, it is thought, there may have been a cometary event that affected North America very severely. Mm. And it might have perturbed the climate and, and stopped the warming trend after the late glacial maximum. This is called the Younger Dryas Event. A lot of people are still trying to prove the, the, the truth of this event. And the way they do it, they go around looking for well-dated sites. And the Bowser Road site is certainly one of those. And they collect little soil samples, looking for cometary particles. And we are privileged to have with us today Professor Malcolm LeCompte, if you will stand up, Malcolm, uh, from North Carolina, who's here to work, do some field work in the Berkshires at a site called Ivory Pond with the owner. Uh, Malcolm worked with us at Bowser Road, and he's going to show you some slides of these cometary particles and um, make you aware of his research, which is very fascinating, I might add. We had quite a few at the Bowser Road. Did we have those cometary particles? Well, listen, I'll step down and, and I'll let Malcolm take over. I should say, I should say thousands, uh, but I don't look at hundreds. This is the Bowser Road site. You can see the large ditch that was, I guess, excavated in 2013 or 2014, where the, the bulk of the mastodon was taken out. This small site here, I've got a, a uh, pointer. I don't know if I have a pointer here or not. Is it? In the middle on top. Middle on top. That doesn't need to be working. 
Um, well, anyway, let's go back one. Uh, I can just give you a quick survey of the site. Uh, back one slide, please. Okay, to the, to the right of the picture is a beach. The be this was formerly a lake. Uh, this is the, the black soil region of, of uh, New York State, very agricultural, very rich soil, as you can see, the color of the soil. Oh, okay, thank you. So to the right is, is the beach for this lake, and it's a different, quite, quite a different uh, mixture of sediment. You've got peat here that's fairly deep, I'd say about 35 inches of peat before you hit a layer of marl. And here is the excavation that was the concern of, of last June where I took the samples. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide, okay, good. Just as a quick uh, overview of the, of the impact hypothesis and the Bowser Road Mastodon, Mastodon site as it relates, um, the asteroid or comet impact is hypothesized to have occurred at the Younger Dryas star, uh, beginning of the Younger Dryas being about 12.8, you see down here, and the uh, Mastodon dated to approximately 12.9, 13,000 years in that vicinity. Um, calendar years we're talking about here. And uh, the right, this is the right time for this, for this event, uh, roughly speaking, and the right place because it's Orange County, New York. Uh, the farm there is the most northeasterly slight closest to southeastern Canada yet explored by, for the YDB impact. Uh, there's problems there, but I wanted to mention that we've got evidence that the impact, the primary impact, appears to have occurred in southeastern Canada on essentially Quebec province or south, uh, southeastern uh, Ontario, but somewhere in southeastern Canada. And a previous site that I, I, I had, uh, ex had sampled and researched was uh, in northeastern Pennsylvania, and it didn't have a date. It wasn't well dated. So I needed a site that was roughly the same latitude. Here we have it. The uh, Bowser Road site was perfect. Next slide, please. It, the I should have mentioned the shallow depth raises some concerns that we'll address shortly uh, for anthropogenic contamination as opposed to cometary or extraterrestrial material. Uh, the proxies that we look for to determine an impact, and this is true for either the YDB or the, the dinosaur killer, the Cape uh, Cre uh, Cretaceous Paleogene, uh, we look for uh, magnetic microspherules. Uh, iron aluminosilicate uh, magnetic aluminosilicate glass magnetic spherules uh, typically are you can say they they melt at at least greater than 1500 C. Uh, it's typically vaporized terrestrial crustal iron and aluminosilicate glass pellets. Think of those as just vapor, kind of a, like an iron or glass rain, molten rain. Uh, that's what it would be like. They're typically of the order of twice the size of a human hair diameter. Um, the uh, there's plenty of, plenty of evidence that those are in the soil. They've been uh, investigated quite, quite, uh, quite a bit. Melt glass is a really good indicator because it tends to be a bit hotter it takes to melt it. You've got uh, inclusions in the melt glass that give you better clues as to the temperature. They're typically bigger, so they're easier to pick out. And then there's the platinum group elements. Of course, iridium was the famous uh, uh, clue to the <coughs> Cretaceous paleogene impact that killed the dinosaurs, where it was contributory to killing the dinosaurs. And uh, <coughs> platinum appears to be the, the key signature for this particular element, although I was involved in some research where we found osmium in the northeastern uh, Pennsylvania site. So any of these three are indicative of, can be indicative of an extraterrestrial impact. And platinum seems to be the most prevalent uh, one that is associated with this particular impact. And uh, We've, of course, have got shock quartz, uh, plan what we call planar deformation features of silicon dioxide quartz, and then an impact nanodimes, which you may have heard of, uh, that are the soil can be very rich in, in a particular layer that dates to 12,900. Uh, variety of allotropes of the diamonds. These are quite expensive to, to look for. I look for those. Uh, I would go broke if I kept on looking for them. I concentrate on the easier things to get, which is the Iron, the spherules, the melt glass, the platinum, and the quartz. Um, well, the quartz is quite hard to determine. Uh, and let's go back one slide if we can. I just want to 
mention why this is, 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 uh, is an important event, we think it either contributed to or accelerated the millennial long younger dryas climate change. It's well known about a 1200 year drop back to glacial conditions during a period when it was warmer actually, the solar insulation was greater than it is today. And we went back into the ice age. And uh, then there's the megafaunal extinction that happened around that time. It was either the abrupt extinction or a progressive in some species case, but you're talking about 35 different species, and they all seem to have disappeared about the same, the same time. Not exactly the same time, but progressively disappeared around that time, or went through population bottlenecks. And then, of course, there's a presumed, based upon point counts and other, other uh, in indicators, that there was a cultural reorganization or these people just began to move about to some place that they could better survive in. So there was some movement of the Clovis population based upon some motivator that we just don't have not well, well determined. So let's go to the next slide and one after that. Next slide, please. Oops, I think we'll go back one. Back one, okay, good. Okay, the scapula was buried at 35 centimeter depth, and that's at the top, the top of the scapula was at the bottom of the plow zone. And it was lying semi-submerged in the transition between the peat above and the, and the clay marl below. And what we found were that there were few to no proxies present in samples below the scapula depth. Essentially none. And there's a lot of phragmites in this area that would tend to move things around. So there were a few directly under the scapula, but not many, so few that they could almost be discounted. Uh, so we would say it was, it was a, a layer that was draped over and then turbated up into the column above the, uh, above into the peat, and was essentially present throughout the peat. And uh, we've got the microspherules in the melt glass were found at all levels at and above the scapula. Uh, but particularly, You'll notice that I've got taken above, top and adjacent to the scapulas for samples, uh, taken from the beach sediment, and then uh, throughout the plow zone into the peat layer. The one piece or one sample that was particularly important was this cryodesiccation crack wedge. Mike pointed this out at the time. I didn't notice it. He said, there's a crack over here. Be careful, thinking that I would want to avoid it. But the crack, or if it's a cryodesiccation wedge, which means that it gets very, very cold. The earth cracks. You're right underneath here. Oh, sorry. Uh, crank up the volume a little bit, I think, or, or is it okay? It's all right. It's all right? Okay. So the cryodesiccation crack tends to be a time capsule. Whatever's falling into the, onto the surface of the, of the current surface then, or, or the top of, of the water of the lake bed, tends to get into that crack, and then later conditions seal it. So what you got there is essentially a snapshot of what was on the surface at the time. And the upper drives would have been the last activator of that, of that uh, cryodesiccation crack. So there's a, a really good test of this, uh, this hypothesis. And it would not be likely to be subject to anthropogenic contamination. Now the idea of anthropogenic contamination from fly ash, from power plants, and the like tends to be countered by the fact that we've got this lens-like occurrence that's not present below the scapula and tends to be featured by, by proxies that have a higher temperature than you typically see in a fly ash or the products of industrial, uh, industrial activity. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, these are examples of the spherules that we found in the cryodesiccation crack. And some of these are very elegant, like this. I call it a uh, Fabergé egg. <laughs> The, the uh, flow features, I hope you can see the flow features that are, are on the surface. Here you've got these dendritic uh, patterns on these and somewhat visible on this one. But these two are, are the best seen and we've got these, these features on the surface which are indicative of a, a movement toward crystallization during its molten state and then it's rapid cooling. So it's quenched and frozen with that crystallization not quite complete. And then the result is these dendritic patterns. That's a classic example of, a, of an impact spheral or what we call a microtectite. Usually these are made not of material from the impactor, but material 
from the crust, the ejecta. So this is what we call distal ejecta, means quite a bit distant from wherever the impact took place. Uh, what's interesting about this guy over here is that you've got this little spot here down in the lower portion that's darker. And what you, you need to understand is, is that the, the electron microscope that's used to image these things will see atomic weights as darker if they're lighter. So the, the bright material is iron, iron splatter on the surface of the spherule. The darker material is some kind of inclusion that's a lighter atomic weight. In this case, most likely silicon. In fact, I'll, I'll show you in another slide here. Can you let's, relate the approximate size of those objects that we're familiar with? In this? Uh, let's, they're about the size, half the diameter of, of a uh, human hair. Thank you. Oh, my <coughs> goodness. And this is a, an example of melt glass that was taken from the Paleo Lake Beach. Was, I should add that the, the density of, of the spherules on the Lake Beach, and as Mike has pointed out to me, this could be an effective wave action or whatever. We're talking about tens of thousands of these things. Typically, at, at any given site that's not associated with a beachfront, you have maybe 500 per kilo up to 1,000 per kilo. These were tens of thousands of spherules. I've never seen some density. Every time I look at a different portion of the slide, I see more and more spherules. You can see the material which they were evolving from. Uh, here you've got a piece of melt glass, quite a bit of, of junk attached to it, just not sticking to it. But you see the vesicles in the side here, which indicate outgassing from the, uh, the interior of the, of the uh, material which indicates that you've got these sharp edges as well as this rounded, very smooth surface, indicating that it's an aluminum silicate. You've got the aluminum here and the silicate here showing a very bright response in the, in the, uh, the EDS spectrum, the energy dispersive spectroscopy that was used, X-ray dispersive spectroscopy used to determine the level abundance of composition. So you've got rich aluminum silicate glass You've got this little white spot here. And remember, white means it's, it's a heavier element. So if we go to the next slide, you see this white spot is magnified. And you see that it's got kind of a flow pattern. This thing was in a melting state. And there's also flow patterns I just happened to notice uh, sitting in the chair that are, that are evolving away from this, this, uh, this brighter spot. But so this white spot here, you can see over here in the iron, uh, these are called elemental maps, where you actually map the uh, electron beam courses over. There's a raster scan of, of the image and produces these maps of, of the elemental composition. You see here that you've got a very bright return, meaning it's very, very rich in, in the iron. What you've got is very poor in aluminum, very poor in silicon, where the matrix is very rich in aluminum and silicon. And oxygen, of course, it's, these are oxides of aluminum and silicon. It's going to be uh, very rich in oxygen. But this is the, the iron is depleted in oxygen. It's very unexpected. Native iron, or iron de oxygen depleted iron, is very rare on the Earth. It just doesn't occur very often. And here we have an example of what appears to be native iron. So that's unusual, and very often it's associated with meteoritic uh, material. Now this temperature isn't so high. This is still a fairly low temperature for an impact. But the, you look at the melting here and the fragmentation of this, of this uh, iron grain, and there's another one above it. If we go back to the previous slide, you'll see, you can almost see this, this trail in these two, uh, two particles in this, uh, this image. And then you can almost see the trail here in the aluminum and silicon signature. Go back to the next Next slide. And I think that's about all we can say there, except that these flowing fragmented tails and the melt mixing tail that you've got there are reflected in this gradation that you see in the elemental map. You see that it's merging with the matrix, and that the matrix is filtering into these regions that are mixed with iron, aluminum, and silicon as the thing melts and dissipates. And it must have been moving in, in the direction toward the right to make that tail. Next slide. Okay, just, just two more slides. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's a, a spheral that was glass. You can see it's aluminum silicate spheral. And then you've got this spot here. Um, 
And then you've got a very bright spot here in the silicon, but the dark, and the aluminum, and the iron. So that means it's a lighter material. And if we go, it must be silicon. So we go to the next slide. And you see that it is silicon. It's 86% silicon. You've got a quartz grain there. It turns out the quartz grains melted at about 1700 C. That's well beyond the, uh, the anthropogenic signature. So you've got another piece of proof there that this is not anthropogenic. This is something different, something much more than that. And we go to the last slide. I believe it's the last slide. The idea here is that this, I mean, even this, this conference is more of questions that I have to address with this hypothesis of a Canadian impact of uh, this, this, this much damage, this much material being spewed out in the ejecta. And the animals and people surviving this event is quite startling. So the question is, how did that happen? And just how maybe we don't understand what this impact event was. Was it a distributed uh, feat or a distributed event or, or a single single impact? Uh, we just don't know yet. But there are a number of, of possible craters that are in this general area. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to make a determination based upon the material that we see in these all future sites. And the last thing is that all the stuff that we see in this site, the remember dry, is, is the same stuff that we pull out of the, the, the KT event. The, so that's what we found, and we're, we're, the uh, investigations continue. We have found platinum there, but it's not yet clear what it means.